Uh, she's just wrapped up her 33rd year as a head coach of the women's basketball program at UNC. Her 44th year overall coaching women's basketball. Uh, she's won 1,020 something games. That's literally what she just told me, 1,020 something. They start to run together when you've won that many. There aren't that many people uh, in the history of college basketball that have won 1,000 uh, basketball games and she's one of them. Uh, she's won nine ACC championships. She's been to three Final Fours and she won the national championship in 1994. Uh, 2013, she was inducted to the Naismith Hall of Fame. Uh, and I believe now that Carolina is the only school to have its uh, men's basketball coach and its women's basketball coach inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, most special for me, uh, Coach Hatchell's family. Um, we both have roots on Quince and Maud's family farm on Cloninger Road in Dallas, North Carolina. Uh, there's 11 and brothers, 11 brothers and sisters, so you have a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins. But I think she's my first cousin once removed. She can maybe confirm that. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but I'm glad she's here, and you guys are going to really enjoy what she has to say. Uh, join me in welcoming to the stage Coach Celia Hatchell. Because thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, everybody? All right, good. Heels. <laughs> All right, good job. Okay, uh, I'm excited to be here with you guys today. We're going to have some fun and get a couple notes, and I do not like standing behind anything like that. It, I just I don't like to be restrained and all that stuff. So I just got a couple notes here, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit. But we're going to have some fun, okay? And I know I, I researched you guys a little bit. Y'all are way smarter than I am. I mean, really, you know, software folks and techs and all that stuff, you know. So, uh, but, you know, life's life, and we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about some things and all. Okay, so we give out the shirts here. I gave the book out and everything. Uh, so, but what we're going to do now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. You know, I do a lot of speaking. I can talk about a lot of things, and I talk to Eric. And like you said, Eric's grandmother and my dad were brothers and sisters. We both come from over on Cloninger Road in Dallas, and uh, when I first came to North Carolina years ago, I've been there 33 years, uh, his grandmother gave me a picture, and she said, Sylvia, he said, she said, take this and give this to Bill Friday. I said, B you know who Bill Friday, he was head of all 17 campuses at that time, and everything, you know, the man, he's probably greater than the governor in this state, and so I like, yeah, I'm going to go see Bill Friday, you know, so, but she stayed after me, so I called over there one day, and his office was up on top of the business school at the time, and he was president of all 17 campuses, so I went over to see him, you know, I walked in, and he's a very southern gentleman, he shook my hand and welcomed me to North Carolina, and so I said, my aunt wanted me to give this to you, I pulled that picture out and handed it to him. And he looked at that, and he looked up at me, and he said, where did you get this? And it was a picture of the, cha the men's basketball championship team, and I think at 19, I don't know when it was, 28, 38, something like that. But it, his, he was on there, and then uh, my uncle, uh, Ralph, who got killed in World War II, was his best friend and was standing beside him. And so for an, at the next hour, he canceled his appointments, and he talked to me about that picture and about growing up over there and how many times he went to my grandparents' house and all that stuff. So after that, the ne until he passed away just a few years ago, every time I'd see Bill Friday, he would call me homegirl. He called me homegirl. So, so we have a great, great background, and Eric's a great guy and, and everything, and so I'm, I'm honored to be here with you. So, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about when I went through leukemia, but a lot of the stuff is related to you, to life, to situations, you know, everything like that. So, but 2013, you saw on there, was a great year for me. Sometimes when so many great things are going good, it's sort of scary. You're like, oh man, this is just too good to be true. Well, that's sort of the way it was in 2013. And uh, because, you know, I was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. If you know anything about basketball, it just doesn't get any better, all right? And then I had my 900th win, and we, then we signed the number one recruiting class in the country. You know, and all that was great until, you know, at, right after the Naismith Hall of Fame. And then I got diagnosed with the worst kind of leukemia you can have, acute myeloid leukemia. Have any of you ever known someone that's had that, acute myeloid leukemia? It's, it's, it's the bad stuff, okay? Uh, in fact... Uh, the number, the percentage of people that, if you make it five years after, you're home free, okay? And my five years was last October. 
all right? But that's... So, so I'm, I'm good to go, you know, I'm healthy as can be and all that stuff, but the percentage of people that get it that survive five years and beyond is 9%. So, you know, I, I'm a blessing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a blessing. I'm a miracle is what I am. And so I, I know that. I, see, I know that every day. So, uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, when you go through tough times and hard things, you know, like when I got diagnosed with leukemia, uh, you know, I remember telling the doctors, I said, no, 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 you saw in the video, I'm not your typical patient now, come on, you know, uh-uh, no, no, I, I'm not your typical patient. Because so much of everything that you do, everything that happens and good things happen to us and bad things happen to us, you know, but it's a mentality that you have. I preach this to my team every day, you know, and, and, but a lot of them don't get it, okay, yet, yet, all right? But it's a mentality that you decide to have. And it doesn't matter what the situation is. You know, like I said, my book says, Fight, Fight, Discovering Your Inner Strengths When Blindsided by Life. But it is, it's an attitude and a mentality that you take. Now, just like when my hair started falling out, let me uh, move this along right here. Okay. I think this will work. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this was a Naismith Hall of Fame. And that is John Swafford. He is commissioner of the ACC. And he actually was the athletic director at North Carolina that hired me, okay? Uh, and let me tell you this. When I went up there and interviewed 33 years ago, he was the athletic director, and they interviewed five people. The other four were already Division I head coaches, and I was at Little Francis Marion down in Florence, South Carolina, down close to the beach, okay? We'd won two national championships, and we'd beaten all the big teams and all that stuff, you know. I loved my life. I had a great job. You know, everything was wonderful down there. You know, but I was, I'd been born and raised in North Carolina. Carolina was my dream school and everything. So when I went, come at, come, I, went, I interviewed with him. And that day before I left, and then this goes back to the mentality, because the other four coaches were already Division I coaches that they interviewed. And their attitude was like, okay, I'm already Division I. I'm successful. What are you going to do to get me to come here and coach your team? That was their attitude. Well, my attitude was, I want this job. Okay? And so I remember that day before I left, I looked at Mr. Swafford, and he was across the, his desk, and before I left, I put my hand on his desk, and I looked at him in the eye, and my hand was like this. And I said, Mr. Swafford, I said, I want this job. I don't care what you pay me. I think that's why he hired me. Okay? <laughs> I told him, I said, I said, I don't care what you pay me. All right? I want this job, all right? But that's John right there, and we actually were inducted into the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame together. He is one of the greatest leaders I've ever known in my life, and one of the greatest men. And in fact, you know, when I first came to North Carolina, our first four years, we were terrible. I mean, we just were trying to get things turned around, and it just, every time I thought we was moving in the right direction, it was a freight train coming at me and everything. And so, but I remember one night, I was coming out of the weight room, and we were, you know, not, it was in January, we were, we were having a bad season. And this was when Mac Brown, in his first time here, his second year, and they were 1-10 in 10 and 1-10. in 10. And so Mac and I used to cry on each other's shoulders because we were both trying to get, the, get things turned around, and we did eventually. But I remember I was coming out of the weight room. John was coming out of the football office, the side door, and we ran into each other. I mean, it wasn't planned. And so as we were walking to the cars, you know, he just walked up to me and he's, you know, how you doing like that and all this stuff. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of conversation. Uh, but like I said, we were struggling and everything. I remember it was raining and stuff. And he, this is a, this is a letter in leadership, uh, a lesson in leadership. John walked up to me and he put his arm around me and he said, you are my coach and I believe in you. And then he turned and got in his car and drove off. Let me tell you what, I wanted to win so bad for him. I wanted to win so bad for him because he said, you are my coach and I believe in you, all right? And that's one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned in leadership. But that was John. All right, this was when I was diagnosed. This was the team holding the rope there for me. This was the Sunday afternoon. I was supposed to be having practice and then I had to go tell them that I had leukemia. This was, you can see my hair is starting to fall out a little bit. But that's a lion for courage. No one could come see me because I had no immune system. All right? And so my former players sent me a line for courage. And then when my hair started falling out, now let me talk to you about this, because I couldn't control that I was going to lose my hair. All right? But I could control how I was going to handle it. All right? And I decided I was going to have a party. So we did. 
I invited the doctors and nurses. They all switched shifts about 4 o'clock or so. So I invited them in the, into my room, and the lady that cuts my hair, which is not too far from here, uh, I said, Wanda, come on over. I said, because, you know, in the mornings I would do like that in my hand. Am I, any of y'all ever lost your hair like that? Anybody? Okay. Hope it never happens to you. So anyway, so, I just, so we started shaving it off. And we shaved off one side and flipped it over. It looked like a punk rocker. And then we shaved off the other side. And then I had a mohawk down the middle, which you see there. And then there's the end results. And so, um, and then they painted Go Hills on the back of my head. All right. So uh, there's my, one of my lead doctors, Dr. Pete Voorhees. All right. I'll just go ahead and show you these. And well, I'll leave it right there now. I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. So, uh, but anyway. Um, but yes, I couldn't control that I was going to lose my hair, but I could call to control how I was going to handle it. And like I said, you know, so I just went ahead. We had the party and, uh, and everything. So, but your hair comes back, you know. Uh, all right, now, the other thing is about the mentality. You know, my philosophy is each and every day I let no one and nothing take my joy away. Only thing that can control my day is me and my maker. You don't have that privilege. I do not give you that privilege. All right? Okay? And so again, put, I tell my players all the time, what goes in your mind comes out in your life. Stay away from bad people. All right? People that talk you down, people that are negative. Stay away from those people. You know, I have this at, uh, with my staff. I carry the, one of these in my pockets all the time. It's a clicker. It's a clicker. This actually came from World War II so that whenever our troops landed, you know, they would do this and that way they'd know that they were, you know, it wasn't the enemy, okay? That's where this came from. But when I carry it in my pocket and whenever somebody's talking negative, you know, just really sucking the life out of things and, you know, being, you know, I got one of those shirts, I don't have it here, but it says be a fountain, not a drain. They're being a drain and not a fountain, you know? And I just, I'm thinking, mm, this, this is not good. This, you know, they're just making the situation worse. I just get my clicker and I go, <laughs> you know, and they all know, shut up, stop, you know, let's, let's turn things around, you know, what we're, what's being said. And it's, it's not helping anything, all right? So I use this clicker all the time. Who wants a clicker? Anybody want a clicker? Any of you guys need a clicker? There you go. There's one, all right, okay. I got two more. Who needs a clicker? Who's back around some bad folks? There you go. Who else? Over here. There you go. There's your clicker. All right, good. I got a stronger arm than I thought. I didn't mean to throw it over your head. All right, so. But again, you know, it's back to that mentality that you have. I just don't like being around negative people. So if, if there's people like that, get them out of your life. Why, why would you want to spend time with somebody like that, you know? Get away from them. Now, uh, the, uh, back to the mentality. You see there the pictures and stuff. I was in the hospital the first time a month, and then I was in there four more times a week each time. And I'm going to tell you, the whole time, I never put on a, on a, a house, a, a gown, pajamas, anything like that. I always had on T-shirts and gym shorts and everything like that. I, did, I didn't put that stuff on, all right? Okay? I always wore my gym, gym sh uh, shorts and stuff like that. And the other thing is, Unless I was t sleeping at night or maybe a, a little nap in the day, I got out of the bed. I got out of the bed, all right? I mean, I was taking, I was, I was hooked up for a solid week to chemo, two kinds of it, all right? And it was just destroying my body, but I had to go through that, you know? But still, uh, I got out of the bed, and we would walk. You'll see right here's a picture. This is uh, Claudio Battellini, Dr. Battellini. We'd get out and walk the halls, all right? And, and, and there's some pictures where we're pushing. We're pushing the stand because I was hooked up to, to chemo and everything. But I got out of bed and I walked, you know, and, and I remember telling, you know, I'd walk down the hall, around the hall there and at Lineburg Cancer Center, and the rooms would be dark, the lights are off, the curtains are pulled, people are in the bed. I'm thinking, how are these people going to get well if they don't get out of the bed? Open up the curtains, get out of the bed, you know? How are you going to get well? You know, so much of it's a mentality that you decide to have. So get out of the bed, all right? And then coaching helped me so much, all right? I mean, I had so, so much encouragement, and I'm going to talk about that in, again in just a few minutes. But, you know, the mentality 
that I had from coaching helped me so much. So everything you do, whether it's leukemia or just a bad situation, you know, and I, Lord knows I go through those, you know, and I'm sure you do too. But you are in control how you handle that. You know, and there was times, you know, whenever I was so sick. I mean, you just can't imagine what a treatments like that do to you. And so, I mean, and sometimes, you know, I, I would I'd get, a pretty, I'd get, get down, but I'd go into my bedroom, I'd get a chair, and I'd sit in front of the mirror, and I'd talk to myself like a crazy woman. I'd say, look, girl, this is not how you handle things now. Get out of your pity party, party get the game plan. Here's what you got to do. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. You know, that ain't going to accomplish anything. You know, you, got to, you, you can do this. You can do this, all right? I'd give myself a pep talk. I'd look in the mirror and do that. Sometimes you have to do that, all right? So, again, the mentality is so important with everything you do. You know, your job's what you do. Some of you may be starting businesses or you're looking to go in a different direction or whatever like that, you know. So, but, that, but you are in control of that stuff. Don't let somebody else control that. You are in control, all right? So make that decision. All right, now, and then I want to do um, a demonstration here. Let's see here. I need somebody to come up here. Anybody, come on. Come on up here. Let's say I'm giving each one of you guys a sheet of white paper. This young lady, what's your name? Caitlin. Caitlin, thank you, Caitlin. And we had a shirt left over here, so I'm going to give it to you. All right? Is that why you cuss me? Okay, there you go. Now, all right, Caitlin, I want you to take that sheet of paper. It's pretty, clean, white, straight. Everything looks good. Now, I want you to wad it up just as, yeah, there you go. Good girl. All right, wad it up. Yeah, you can stomp on if you want to or whatever anyway. All right, good, good. Okay, good, good job. All right, now. Now I want you to straighten it out and make it look like it did before you started crinkling it up. There you go. Come on. Do, do the best you can. You can do anything you want to. Just try to make it without any wrinkles in it. Make it straight, clean, pretty, clear, everything. All right. She's trying. I mean, you know, you, you could even take an iron to it, but you're not going to be able to get all those crinkles out. Okay? So I want to read this to you, and I want you to listen to me. Before you say something and hurt someone, take a piece of paper and crumble it up. Have you done that? Yes, we have. Good. Now try to make it the way it was before. You can't, right? People's hearts are like this piece of paper. Once you have hurt them, it is difficult to leave them in the, the, the same way that you found them before it started, okay? So before you hurt someone and say something, think hard about what you're saying. All right? Whether you say it or whether you, you know, send it on social media or something like that, think about that because once you say it, it's done. All right? Now stay right there. Same thing. I do this with my team. I do a lot of demonstrations. Here you go. Now, I want you to I want to put some toothpaste on here if I can get it to come out. I need to probably pop that a little bit here, get the oh, crinkles out of it. Well, if I can get it to come out. Well, we're having a technical difficulty here. You guys probably know how to figure this out. All right, let's see here. It's some in here. It's just that little stopped up. The little stopped up. There you go. Come on. Come on. Maybe if you open it up. Well, you are smart. Look at her. She's, she's, a, she's, a, she's telling me how to do everything right here, and I, uh, she's, she's, she's got it down here. And I don't even have a, have a pen up here. But, all right, we're going to improvise here. Imagination. I have squeezed all this toothpaste out here on that stick. All right? And now I would tell her, all right, put it back in there. And if I squeezed it all out there, she'd be trying to put it back in there. Now, some of it, a little bit of it might go in, but she'd make a really, really big mess, you know, because you can't put, once, once it comes out of your mouth, you can't put it back in there, all right? It's not going to work, all right? Sorry for the difficulty. Thank you. Great. Have a seat. 
All right. So these are some things that you know I want you to think about. All right, as you work your business, do your job, your families, everything like that. So think about that. It's a mentality and attitude that you decide. All right, you decide. All right, now. Next thing I want to talk to you about, and this is really important to me, is the exercise. All right? You see here, I was going through the treatments like you can't imagine. Most people don't survive. But I'm going to tell you one reason I made it through the treatments was because I was I exercised and because I was in good shape. Every day I exercised. Every day I worked out. I mean, and y'all, let me tell you what. You know I'm Southern when I say y'all. Guys, the, the treatments, you feel like you got the flu about 100 times. Okay? That's about what you feel like. You don't feel like getting out of the bed. You don't feel like doing anything. You know, but I'd get out and exercise. We'd walk 17 times around was a mile. All right? and, but every time I worked out, I always felt better. Always. Always felt better. So I, exercising is huge. All right? uh, like I said, I'd walk. I, in my room, I had free bands. I had weights, all that stuff and everything. Because um, you know, to get well, you're going to have to exercise. If you don't use it, you lose it. All right? I have a trainer I work out with now all the time and everything. So that is so, so important. Now, before I left over at the hospital, the first I was there for a month, and I had to walk the halls, exercise in my room. I was so concerned about all the other people on the hall because about every other day somebody died, right? I mean, I was in the worst part of the cancer hospital, all right? And they were in the bed, curtains drawn, all that stuff. You know, it was really bothering me. All right, so the day before I left the first time, I had Shelly Earp, who's head of the Lineberg Cancer Center. I had Tom Shea, who was head of the transplant unit. I had my lead doctor, Dr. Pete Voorhees. I had Ned Sharpless, who is now head of the National Cancer Institute for the whole United States of America. All right, I had all them right in front of me. I said, guys, look, y'all are so smart. You're so good at what you do. I said, if these people are going to get well, they've got to get out of the bed and exercise. We've got to have a place for them to exercise while they're here taking treatments. All right? That's what I told those guys. And so I made a commitment right then that I was going to do something about that. And I'm going to tell you what now, guys. I have a, up in the mountains of North Carolina, right outside of Black Mountain, I have a blueberry farm up there. And I was just up there this past weekend because we had a work day. All right? And we're getting over 300 blueberry bushes up, ready to go. And we pruned and trimmed and put, put out mulch. And the basketball team from UNC Asheville came, from Montreat and all that stuff. About 70 people. We worked all day Saturday, and then I fed them all. You know, because that blueberry uh, patch, it's not a patch, it's more than that because it's over 300 bushes. But on the trees and everything, I have signs up. And it is Limeburger Cancer Center Blueberry Patch. And it says, honor system, pick your own, mail checks to Limeburger Cancer Center. All right? And I want you to know that we took, I've taken that money the past few years from the Blueberry Patch, and we have put in two workout rooms at the cancer hospital. Two workout rooms, okay? <laughs> so, you know, and, and it's, it's amazing. I can tell you more about that, about the Blueberry Patch and everything like that, you know, and, and the people that come up there. And, you know, one lady had a hat on one day, and I was up there, and she took her hat off, and, you know, she had a couple little you know, stubs of hair, and she's told me that she had cancer, and then another lady came, and she said when she comes to the blueberry patch to pick, and when she does, she feels uh, her, she lost her husband to cancer, she felt close to him. I mean, it's on and on and on. But the thing is, you know, we got two, two workout rooms now over at the hospital for our, our, the patients to exercise. You know, and I'm going to tell you, just recently, we're going to do some more stuff. That's one of the things I'm so passionate about is, you know, patients exercising so they can survive and get better. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of projects because one of the top guys in the country with cancer research told me, he said, Sylvia, he, she said, what you, you know, the exercise rooms and all that stuff, he said, uh, that, that is the future of cancer survivorship. The future of cancer survivorship. So exercise. I don't know if you exercise or not, but do it. You know, priority, it's one of my priorities, but it helped me survive. It helped me survive. And like I said, there's Dr. Bathalini. He's an exercise sports science oncologist. And see, there we are, my bald head. And here we are. We're in the, we worked out in my room. See, there, there's in my room. There I am in the cancer center doing my bands, okay? 
And they, even uh, in between, when I got out of the hospital the first time, I, I had to go back every 48 hours to get, give, get blood platelets. And then I was in there for four more times a week at a time. But even at my house, we would walk every morning. We'd go out and walk. All right? This is the infusion lab over there where I had to go every 48 hours and get blood platelets. I had on a wig right there, you can see. Uh, now, after I got out, I went back over there, and they have a children's, they have a, uh, the children's unit over there for cancer. They have a school, full-time school. You know, it's part of the Chapel Hill School District. And, uh, and now I sponsor the school, okay? So you can see the classroom there, pediatric oncology classroom. Uh, and then here, I'm giving a dirty look because you see it says, a side, 17 laps, one mile. I did that many times. All right. And then the first time I went back over there, I took my team. And I, I'm going to tell you, you know, guys, I'm, I'm a person. I'm, you know, hey, just deal with it. You know, I mean, in my office, I got a big sign behind my desk, and it just says, put on your big girl panties and deal with it. You know, I mean, really. You know, sometimes you have to do that. I just like, come on, get a life, deal with it. You know, you can handle this and all that stuff. But I want to tell you, first, first time I went back over there, it's and after I finished everything and I'd been released, I, you know, my hair's still short, but it's coming out. And I was, I was up on that hall, fourth floor, and I'm going to tell you guys, I had to get out of there. I had to get out of there. I was about to have a panic attack. I never had a panic attack in my life, but I had to get out of there, okay? So uh, because of, of the, you know, now there's Blueberry Patch. You see that? There it is. Lineberg Cancer Center, and there's my golden retriever, Maddie. And let me tell you what, that dog, when I was sick, she stayed with me every second, Every second. I can tell you more about that. I won't. And then uh, the, uh, uh, I was still in treatments, and there's the doctors, some of the doctors and all. But the Women's Basketball Coaches Association gave a million dollars to Limeburger, all right? And part of that was because, you know, I'd, what all I'd gone through and everything. So, you know, you never understand why something happens to you, all right? But there's always a reason. There's so many things that have happened since I had leukemia that I would have never even been a part of or never even thought of, all right? Be the match. I mean, guys, people were trying. I, I couldn't find a match for a transplant. And so people all over, all over the world were trying to help me find a match. All the best I could find was a 7 out of 8, and you need a 10 out of a 10. You know, and so, I mean, everywhere people were doing be the match, trying to help me, help, help me find a match. And, let, and guys, I'm going to tell you, I know of four, four situations and there may be more, but I know of four, all right, where people did be the match for me, all right? Now, they weren't a match for me, but they've been a perfect match for somebody else, and they've gone and gave their bone marrow and saved somebody else's life. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had leukemia. Four other people's lives were saved because people were trying to help me. So, you know, things happen for a reason like that. And then, so the exercise, you know, there's a big part. And then the next thing is support system. When you're going through hard times, you need support, all right? Sometimes you got to be the person that's receiving support. Sometimes you got to be the one giving support. But I'm going to tell you what, friends, family, my girlfriends, a bunch of them got together, and there were 17 of them, and they did a schedule. And for seven and a half months, I did not spend one second by myself. One didn't leave until the other one got there, whether I was in the hospital or whether I was at home. And I was high maintenance because I was on a uh, neutropunic diet and, and everything. My food had to be certain things. Some things had to be sterilized, mask, everything, and stuff like that. But my girlfriends got together and did that for me. And then the fraternity of coaches all over the world. On my phone, right back here in my bag, I have messages I saved. I got them from, wow, Pat Summit called me every day when I was in treatments. Uh, I got one from Mike Krzyzewski on there. I got one from Robin Roberts. I got one from Stuart Scott before he passed away. I got one from Mike Krzyzewski. You know, I've got, a, 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 I've got on and on and on. I've saved a bunch of them, all right, because I had so much support from all the other coaches and everything. So, um, and then cards and letters and stuff like that. But I want to do another little demonstration for you. And this is about support. And also back to that mentality and people that are around and different things like that. So uh, let's see, I've already used you. Let me have another demo. One of you guys stand up here. You just come stand right here. All right, you can just stand right there. Now, let me ask you something. Give me your hand. Is it easier for him to give me a tug and pull me down there with him, or would it be easier for me to pull him up here where I am? 
What's the easiest? Yeah. He could just pull me right down there and it'd, it'd, that'd be like a feather. I mean, he could just give me a jerk and I'm down there. Now, for me to, to lift him up here, I'm strong, but that may be about impossible. So let, let me read this to you. If I stand on the edge of a stage, which we are, and I'm trying to pull you up while you're trying to pull me down, which is easier to do? I just asked you that and you answered it. It's always easier for someone to pull you down than for you to pull them up. People who pull you down are not your friends. Friends pull you up. Friends encourage you in your pursuit, all right, and always are there for you. Simple, okay? So get away from those people that try to pull you down. Thank you, all right? And you know who they are. You know who they are, all right? So again, I'm giving y'all some life lessons, but I'm sure you, I'm, I can see, I can look at you and see your wheels are turning. I know somebody like that. I know somebody like that. I know somebody like that. You know, I want to ask you something. When you point your finger at somebody else, you got three of them coming back at you. How about you? Okay? Would, would, would someone want to be like you or have your mentality or your attitude? All right? I tell my players all the time, do a checkup from the neck up and get rid of any stinking thinking you got in your head. All right? Really? I'm serious. Because I want to tell you now, you know, y'all, social media right now, I mean, it's just, whew, it, it's bad stuff. Bad stuff. So that's the support system. Now, I talked to you a little bit about Be The Match, you know. Again, that's an un unbelievable organization. You know, I'm so committed to Be The Match and everything like that. Our Lineberger Cancer Center is just awesome, awesome, awesome. And I'm going to tell you this. If you or a member of your family ever gets cancer, you don't know what to do, call me. And I'm serious. I say this all the time. I probably, in the last, since I was in there, we've probably gotten 25 people in. All right? And I, I know, I don't think she'll mind me telling you this, but uh, Ann Graham Lotz and I are really good friends. That's Billy Graham's daughter. Last September, she uh, called me, said, let's have lunch. I said, okay. So I met her. She said, uh, I need to talk to you. I said, what? She said, uh, I just got diagnosed with breast cancer. And I'm not sure what route to go, where, what to do. I pulled out my phone. I called Shelly Earp, head of the cancer center. Got a cell phone. Uh, he answered. I said, Shelly, I'm with Ann Graham Lotz right here. She was just diagnosed with breast cancer. He said, hand her the phone. And so I handed her the phone. They talked for a while, and in a couple of days, she was in our cancer center. And she just finished her treatments for, uh, uh, well, she's got uh, just a couple more radiation. She finished all the chemo and just a couple more radiation treatments. Okay? You know, and I'm not saying that. It's, that's, I don't want to bring any recognition to me, but I'm just saying to you that, you know, we have a wonderful cancer center. And so much when you get that call, the fear factor, it's just overwhelming. So I'll help you if I can, all right? And so, and, and that, that's just an example of, of uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's an unbelievable resource. So, uh, but the cancer center, it's just, it's just incredible. And I talked to you about the blueberry patch and everything like that uh, and, and what we do with the blueberry patch. All the money goes back to the cancer center. And uh, then... Um, you know, we've put the workout rooms in. Uh, we just did the work day this weekend. The blueberries will start coming in about the, probably about the middle, the end of June. So if you want something nice to do, come up there. It's, you can get off at Black Mountain. and about, It's about seven miles off the interstate towards uh, Chinny Rock and Lake Lure. All right. Now, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you the rest of the time a little bit about teamwork and getting things done and opportunities and all. Uh, so, but, you know, it's not about what we gather, it's about what we scatter. All right? I say that all the time. It's not about what we gather, it's about what we scatter. You know, and, you know, as I've coached all these years, um, you know, I've had so many great players and everything like that, you know, but my goal is that I want to have a great harvest. I want to reap a great harvest, all right? And my coaching tree, there's probably 60-some in my coaching tree if they either played for me or worked for me that's out there doing the same thing. You know, and, and, and that, I love that. You know, but I want to reap a great harvest. And I know you do too with what you do, with your family, your business, whatever. But you know what? You can't reap a great harvest if you don't plant seeds. Okay? So you got to, you got to look for those opportunities to plant seeds. So, 
you know, and so I, I believe that we are blessed so we can bless others, okay? We're blessed so we can bless others, all right? So that again, you know, plant those seeds, you know, treat other people the way you want to be treated, that type of stuff, all right? I know I'm starting to preach to you a little bit here, but, uh, but now, I want to do a demonstration here, and I've got two people's names that I'm going to call up here, and I wrote them down here. They were on my sheet uh, that I had. I got too many sheets laying around here. A different thing. Here it is. Okay, let me have here uh, Danielle Michaels and Sierra uh, Bertel. What's this? Bertelman. Are you guys here? Come on up. Come on up here. All right, now, y'all stand in the middle right over here. I do this with my team all the time, okay? Every year, I do this with my team. All right. Sierra, that's you, okay? And the other was Danielle. Danielle, there you go. Sierra, there you go. All right, now. Let's play here a minute. Let's say that I'm going to give each one of you one of these, okay? Everybody's got one of these. And then I will say to you, personalize it. That means we do this with the team in the locker room. We put magic markers, crayons, and everything out, and I say, all right, personalize it. That means so when I pick it up and look at it, I can say, this is Danielle, this is Sierra, all right? What would you put on yours so that I would know that it's you? It could be anything about your personality, what you like, or, you know, different things like that. But what would you do? It's, so, it's bad to say, but that's our world now, okay? You know, I mean, that's, that's what we have to deal with each and every day, all right? Okay? Now, so there's lots of things we do to break each other. All right, now, I'm going to see if either one of y'all should have been a surgeon. All right, bandage her back up. Okay? And bandage her back up. Do the best you can. See if one of these has been a surgeon. But, you know, just in our lives every day, we, we, people break you down. That's why I've said stay away from those people. Get them out of your life, you know. Get you a clicker, you know. Say, mm 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 No, don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it, all right. Don't surround yourself with those people. That's bad, all right. So, uh, all right, who's got one done? Okay, now, that's pretty good, all right. <laughs> So now I'm going to take Sierra. I'm going to put her right here in the middle, you guys. Right smack in the middle. All right, now break her. Come on, you're strong. Break her. Nope. Okay. All right. Let me have Danielle now. Put her right here in the middle. Okay, good. All right, now break her. <laughs> she is strong. She is strong. You can tell she works out. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right, now, guys, there's strength and unity and togetherness, okay? When you're out there by yourself, it don't matter how good you think you are or how other people say you are or whether the newspaper writes or whatever, you know, your evaluation was or whatever like that, you know, that doesn't matter. When you're out there by yourself, you can be broken, all right? There's strength and unity and togetherness, whether it's your home, your business, your church, your school, whatever. All right, because success is about relationships. Success is about relationships. All right. Now let's say all of a sudden one of you guys, I don't like what we're doing. I don't care for these people, and I'm going to pull away. So they do that, and then somebody else says, "Well, if they're going to act like that, I ain't going. I'm not going to be a part of this either." So they go over there like that, you know. And then another one does the same thing. Now, as each person pulls away. They make themselves weaker, but as each one pulls away, what do they do to the core? They make it weaker, okay? They make it weaker, okay? All right. Now, he said a good thing, make it tighter. Sometimes you can get, you know, because somebody's got to carry the load, but overall, as each one pulls away, you will end up making the unit weaker, all right? So just think about that. Think about that. All right, you guys did a good job. Have Thank a seat. You, Thank you. All right, now, okay, um, 
I've got one story. Okay. I got one closing story I want to give you. And then I'm going to finish up. This is a true story. It happened about right before I got leukemia. We had a team, we were ranked top five in the country. It was the end of the year. Uh, and my birthday's February 28th, same day as Dean Smith's. And I have wonderful neighbors in Chapel Hill. And my neighbors wanted to have a birthday party for me. Well, at that time of the year, last week of the regular season, the last thing I wanted was a birthday party. You know, but great neighbors, they want to have something. So, okay. So it was going to be Saturday at 1 o'clock. Well, that was the last weekend of the season. We were playing on Friday night at Maryland on national television, a doubleheader, the 9 o'clock game. All right? And then on Sunday, we had Duke at home at 1 o'clock. You think, Coach, what a schedule. Why would you do that? Well, I didn't make that schedule. The conference office does that. We just have to do what they tell us to do. So we go to Maryland to play, and we're on national television, late game, and all that stuff, you know, and we, and they were ranked too. We were both ranked tops in the country. I think we were fifth or sixth, and they were probably about, we were right neck and neck with each other. And we were playing up there. Well, they beat us. We got beat like, I think, 17 points. It was awful. I was so mad because I'm not a good loser, okay? And I hope I never become one. But, so, but, you know, we, we got beat. You know, when game was over with, 11 o'clock, time we do press conference, all that stuff, shower, get out of there. It's probably 1 or so. Get to the airport, you know, at uh, BWI up there, and we fly back. We land here in Raleigh, Durham. Probably the sun's coming up by then probably five, four or five o'clock at least. And so then I didn't even go home. I went straight to the office because we had to grade film and we had practice at 10 o'clock. We had film work at 10 and then practice because we were playing Duke the next day at 1. All right? It's a Saturday morning. So anyway, I'm, you know, we're doing all this film work. I'm on the court practicing everything. And then in my phone, I felt it vibrate in my pocket. And I looked at it and I forgot about the birthday party. So I finished up practice, I ran home, you know, changed clothes, went down to my neighbor's house, I went in, I was late of course, you know, and they were already eating and all that stuff, and there's probably, I don't know, 45, 50 of my neighbors in there, and so I went around shaking hands and saying hello to them and, you know, everything like that, and so then I went in the kitchen and I sat down in a round table, sort of like probably some of you guys have in your kitchen, and I sat down there, and some, two of my neighbors, an elderly couple, their names are Eddie and Patsy, and they were both, he's, he was probably close to 90. She's probably 85, something like that. So, and they were sitting in there, and, you know, so I sat down with them, and, you know, we were chit-chatting and eating and everything, you know, and people were coming up and giving me cards and saying things and all that. And so Eddie said to me, he said, Coach, he said, I don't have you a birthday present. He said, but I guess my birthday present to you is some advice. And I thought, mm. Here's somebody else trying to tell me how to coach my team, okay? I know we got beat bad last night at Maryland, and here's somebody else. But out of respect for, for Mr. Eddie, I said, yes, sir. So I sat there, and he said, and we had been talking about, we got on the subject about the, the blueberry farm up in the mountains and uh, everything. So we'd been chatting, and somebody had come up and said something to me that they had made a donation or something like that. And so Mr. Eddie, he said, talking about the mountains of North Carolina, he said, it reminds me, of when my bride, Patsy was sitting beside of him, and he reached over and rubbed her arm. He said, my bride of some 60 years, okay? So he said, when we first got married. He said, we got married, we went to the mountains of North Carolina on our honeymoon, probably Asheville area and all that stuff. And he said, and we were coming back through Black Mountain, and he said, my new bride wanted some ice cream. So he said, I stopped to get her some ice cream. And I said, Mr. Eddie, I think I know exactly where you're talking about. It's an eye vision place now. And he said, well... He said, I pulled up, pulled up, walked down the sideways a little, sidewalk a little ways to get her some ice cream. And he said, I went in there and I got two cones of ice cream and had one in both hands and I paid the lady and all that stuff. And I was turning and going out the door. And he said, about the time I got to the door, he said, the door come, boom, come flying open, you know. And he said, three little boys come running in and they were hot and sweaty and everything, you know. And he said, I jumped back so I wouldn't dropped my ice cream, and he said, and I stood back here as they come rushing in, and then he said, I witnessed those little boys going up to the ice cream counter, and he said, and I saw where one little boy 
didn't have enough money to get ice cream. And he said, and I saw tears roll down his face and his head drop because he didn't have money to get ice cream. And Eddie said, but I was halfway out the door and my ice cream in both hands and, me, and I didn't want to melt and I was going to get, take it to my bride. And he said, I, I walked to the car and I got in and I handed Patsy her ice cream and he said, and I told her what I had just witnessed in that ice cream store. He said, you know what, I should have bought that little boy some ice cream. He said, I'll be right back. So Eddie got out of the car and he said, I walked down the street, went inside, the little boys weren't in there. He said, I asked the lady behind the counter, those little boys that were just in here? And she said, yeah. I said, one of them didn't have enough money to get ice cream. And she said, yeah. I said, did he get some? No, he didn't get any. Well, do you know who he was? No, I don't know who he was. Well, do you know where, where, where they went? She said, no, they went out the door and went on down the street somewhere. So Eddie said, I went out and I went up and down Cherry Street in Black Mountain. said, I went up and down Cherry Street. I went in every shopping store trying to find that little boy because I wanted to buy him some ice cream. You know, and he said, I just, I, I was searching so much for that little boy, you know, because I should have bought him some ice cream. And so then he just stopped, and he had tears in his eyes. And his bride of some 60 years, Patsy, reached over there, and she rubbed his arm, and she had tears in her eyes. And she looked at me, and she said, and coach, he's still looking for that little boy today. All right? So I want to end with the message that When life gives you opportunities, take advantage of them, okay? Because once they're gone, they're gone. And when Mr. Eddie said that to me and Miss, and, uh, Miss Patsy, I'm still looking for that little boy today. And he said, when God puts opportunities in front of you, take advantage of them. And I told Mr. Eddie, I said, Eddie, I said, that's the best birthday present I have ever been given, ever, all right? And that's true. So being here with you today is an opportunity for me. All right? I see this as an opportunity. So go out and take advantage of the opportunities that you have. And I'm going to close by showing you two things. This is two things that I, I use and I live by. You probably can't see this, but you guys on the front can see this. this I have these in my office. This is a plaque, and it says, Bloom where you're planted. Okay? You can't always be in charge of where you're planted, but you can bloom there, and that's a choice and decision that you make. All right? And then this last one, this is my thing. This is how I live my life. Okay? In fact, there's two, two things. I got this one on the plaque. But when I was so, so sick and didn't know if I was going to live or die, all right? Weak, oh, man. And I remember one Sunday morning, I was listening to David Jeremiah, and he said this, and I've adopt, I, I wrote it down, and it's still laying beside my bed, and it says, a godly woman in the center of God's will is immortal until God is done with her. So I just look for those opportunities. And then, I love this. It says, be the kind of woman that when her feet hits the floor in the morning, the devil says, oh crap, she's up. <laughs> okay? All right? This is my theme right here. So every morning... Okay, I want to be the kind of woman so every morning when I get up and put my feet on the ground, the devil says, oh crap, she's up. Okay, thank you for the opportunity.